Well, good morning once again to everyone out there. Appreciate you joining here, joining us here at Calvary Baptist Church as we once again uh, seek to live, live stream the service or the message at least. Uh, we thank you for joining us. We encourage you to uh, continue to share the page and continue to um, encourage others to listen in. And please, by the grace of God, please be praying for this service today. I'd like to begin a series uh, today, hopefully through the book of Revelation. So I'll share some things more about that as we go along. But uh, before we get into the word today, we'd like to, we have a couple of pre-recorded songs, uh, one led by one of our song leaders, Brother Ian Goddard, he's going to lead this one. And then we have a special number by Sister uh, Martin, Sister Crystal Martin, a pre-recorded uh, of the song she's going to play before we go into the Word of God. So please listen in, be praying, and join us as we continue hearing the Word of God. Join me as we turn to Hindles to number 496, Victory in Jesus. Praise the Lord that we have victory in Him. 
Um, I've been praying and seeing the Lord's will as to what to continue preaching. It seems like we'll be on this forum for a little while, so uh, I wanted to share some things I believe pertinent to the times in which we live. And so um, I believe uh, the Lord has laid upon my heart this book of Revelation, a great book of the Bible, um, especially in the times in which we live in. I believe the church desperately needs to hear from this book. As a matter of fact, the entire world needs to hear from this book. Some folks are uh, uh, concerned that the you know, Revelation is a book that uh, you know, may confuse them and things like that. But I do believe this book was written, of course, to the church of the living God. And so I want to speak for the next few Sundays, Lord leading, uh, on the subject, four needs of the church in times of crisis, or four needs of the church today. Four needs of the church today. I desperately believe, brothers and sisters, that uh, as the church remains, so to speak, as separated, uh, in lockdown around the world, different countries, I, I believe that God's people, we need some direction from the Word of God. We need some help from the Word of God. And I want to use this book today and present, uh, we will not be going through verse by verse per se. It's going to take a long time, but I would like to capture a few things that I believe the church desperately needs. And this book supplies um, four needs of the church. Now, I won't be able to deal with all of them today, so I'll, I'll, I'll announce them all, but I'll hopefully deal with one of them, okay? But before we do so, we'd like to open the Word of God um, in Re Revelation chapter 1, and I'm going to read verse, verses 1 down to verse number 8. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 to 8, and then we'll pray, and we'll dive into the Word of God today. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 through 8. And I read, the Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Notice that. Things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the words of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia Grace be unto you and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and have made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, said the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Four needs of the church today. Of course, we're going to go back into some, some verses in this text. And we're going to explore at least up between verses 1 and verse 18 of the chapter this morning. As we deal with one of the first needs I believe the church has today. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help as we need his help as we deal with this. Father in heaven, today we thank you so much for an opportunity to open the word of god once again thank you for the book of revelation you've given to us that we can have in times like these times of crisis times of um of of of, of, of difficulty and times of challenge dear god as the church remains in quarantine and separated one from the other and father i pray today that god the holy spirit will move and you help me for without you i can do nothing 
I pray cleanse my mind and heart from sin, cleanse my soul, fill me with your spirit, oh God, that whatever is said here, whatever goes on across the waves, that God would serve to minister and to challenge and change and reach the hearts of men. Thank you, Father, Lord God. We thank you for the book of Revelation, and I pray that God would open our understanding to the other word of God. Thank you, Lord God. We give you all the glory and all the praise, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, the book of Revelation is probably one of the most fascinating books of the New Testament. Um, because this book presents so much prophetic material that's relevant to today's condition. Um, it, it presents so much prophetic material that it cannot be rightly ignored. As a matter of fact, the book of Revelation is fascinating in that it presents in such vivid detail what is soon to be the world condition, what I believe in the next, I believe in, in a not too distant future. Revelation is literally history written in advance. And some people are afraid to read the book because of the frightening descriptions of judgments and horrible occasions and horrible occurrences on the earth. Some people think we are actually going through these conditions of judgment right now. Of course, I disagree. I don't believe we're going through the terrible judgments of Revelation at this time. We are going through judgment. The Bible reveals that, that God hates sin and God is judging sin and God does judge sin. But the the scale of judgment that is described in Revelation, I don't believe we're going through that right now. And so some people believe we are going through these conditions right now. But some people also think that these, uh, what you might call prophecies and these symbols of Revelation, they believe that they are just allegorical and they are not describing actual literal events. Now, I do believe that there are many symbols in the book of Revelation. There are some allegorical uh, episodes there, but the book by itself is not allegorical. The book is an actual description of what will happen on our world when Jesus Christ returns and takes the church. So to say it's totally allegorical is incorrect. But some people also believe that they cannot understand the symbolisms and uh, they think that they will be confused and misrepresent and misinterpret the teachings of Revelations. So they simply don't read, they leave it alone. And some are still too lazy to read because they have no interest in its meaning, in its message. Some others, particularly false teachers, they try to capitalize on the ignorance of the average man. And they falsely present and represent this book in a way that would frighten people into just getting baptized and keeping the rules of their cults. I do believe, my friend, that God has given the book of Revelation to the church of Jesus Christ. As you will notice, it says in verse number one, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show, notice that, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And then in verse 4, the Bible says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So Revelation is written and has been written, so to speak, for the church. It's written for us, brothers and sisters. It's written so that you and I can read it and know what God has planned for planet Earth. Look what the Bible tells us in verse number 3. And I'm coming back to these verses, but look what it says in verse 3. It says, blessed is he that read it. And they that hear the words of this prophecy... And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. 
The time is at hand. So Revelation is good to read. It's good to listen. But notice it tells me that there are things in there that the church, the Christians, need to keep. Blessed are those that keep those things that are written therein. For the time is at hand. Indeed, the book of Revelation describes some awful conditions that are coming to this world. Things like war and farming and bloodshed and unprecedented violence, earthquakes, disturbances even in the planets, widespread demonic activity, widespread drug use, and the wholesale slaughter of believers. These indeed, my friend, are frightful things to think about. Uh, but these and more will happen in that frightful hour. The scriptures uh, 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 designate the time when that will happen. It will be seven years from the rapture of the church to the revelation of Jesus Christ. Or the seven years that will ensue between the time Jesus takes the church and the time he returns with the church to reign on this earth. So Revelation is a book that should be read. And I believe in the times that we are now living is a great book to spend time in and read and consider what God says to the church. Because I believe that the church has four main needs today. Revelation presents them and speaks to them. But these are not, as a matter of fact, the judgment we mentioned a while ago, these are not primarily what Revelation is about. Look at verse 1. In plain language, the Bible tells us this. In verse 1, the Bible says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So revelation, although it speaks of great judgments and horrible occasions and occurrences on this earth, the book is about the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book is primarily the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ is the central theme and all the events and the judgments, they point toward a consummation, ushering in the King of Kings, who will be sitting upon his throne and taking rightful control of his kingdom. You see, Revelation is actually the fulfillment of the prayer that the saints have been praying for centuries. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The church has been praying for that, brothers and sisters. God's true believers have been praying that the kingdom of God would come on this earth and Christ would set up his throne on this planet. And it will happen, friend. There is a day and a time in which it will happen. And Christ would rule this world with a rod of iron sitting on his throne in Jerusalem on the seat of David. The Bible tells me it's going to happen. But before that happens, Revelation describes some of the judgments that will take place as Christ descends from heaven, friend, to do justice to this planet that has rejected him. So what a moment for the church to read Revelation. I believe we are in danger, even as we are in lockdown. I believe the church is now facing another danger. I believe the church is facing the danger of, uh, of, of becoming so callous and cold and becoming so used to probably, uh, you know, church by media. I believe the church may become so sensitized to this form of worship that we may lose some of the fervor and, my friends, some of the readiness and the expectancy of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we may move into what I concern, what I'm concerned to be a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. Revelation is a book, I believe, that can stir that sense of urgency and revival in our hearts. 
because the book is about the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Christ is the central theme. I would like to state at the outset as well that as we approach this book, I would approach this book, and I believe most fundamental Bible preachers would approach this book from the standpoint of a literal interpretation. We go with the symbols and the allegorical only as they are indicated in the context. Yes, the book has some allegorical uh, portions, like chapter 12, I think. It has a lot of symbols indeed. But for the most part, the book is a literal description of events on this planet and the response of men to the Creator. Revelation is a book the church needs to read in time of crisis because I believe the book answers to four needs the church has today. And since much of the book is prophetic, it is a narrative that will unfold on this earth sometime in the future. 2,000 years ago, even as the book was written, it has certain historical aspects. It was, first of all, describing the vision that John had as he was banished on the Isle of Patmos for his faith in Christ and for preaching the Word of God. So you find from in, in chapter 1, from verse 1, down to verse number 18, John was describing, and even down to verse 20, John was describing the events that happened to him while he was on the Isle of Patmos one Sunday morning, when he was in the Spirit on Sunday morning, and the Spirit of God revealed to him what was going to happen to the church, what's going to happen to the world, what's going to happen as Jesus Christ is revealed, my friend. John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, the Bible tells me. Sunday morning, Sunday sometime during the day, John was banished. He was alone, so to speak. He was on, you might call it a lockdown, a quarantine all by himself on the Isle of Patmos. And in that moment, God gave him the book of Revelation. I do believe, friend, in the moment of lockdown and the moment of quarantine and the moment of us staying away from the world and the things out there, I believe these are great moments when God is willing to reveal some things to his people as he did to John as John was quarantined on the Isle of Patmos. What a moment, what a memory. As John was quarantined there for his faith in Jesus Christ, God gave him Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And that's a book I know the enemy hates. That if there are two books of the Bible that the devil hates most, it will be Genesis that tells us where all things came from. And the first book of the Bible, and then the last book of the Bible, Revelation, that tells us where all things are headed. But God has given John that book 2,000 years ago, describing what would happen to the earth in what I believe is the very near future. The book was written to the churches of Jesus Christ. And it was written to the churches of Jesus Christ, which were experiencing difficulties in the times that they were living. It was difficult spiritually for many of them. The Bible talks about one of the churches, and we're going to get to that, that was located in the seat or at the seat of Satan, where Satan dwelt. It, it talked about another church that had a woman preacher named Jezebel that was teaching the church members to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols. It talked about a church that had lost their first love. It talked about a church that had left Christ out. And so the churches, my friend, were experiencing significant spiritual problems. There was also political and moral problems, difficulties in the church. And this book was written when John was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, describing God's answer for the church in times of crisis and difficulty. Notice the book was intended to be circulated so that all the churches, the seven churches of Asia, would have a copy. Notice what the Bible tells me here in verse, in verse number uh, in verse number 19. It says, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars 
which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels, or the pastors of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And then the Bible tells me here in verse 11, it says, say, I say, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, notice it says, what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, and unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Revelation was a book meant to be circulated among all the churches so that they would have a copy which I believe would provide these four things that we speak of in a time of confusion, in a time when the church is in crisis, in a time when the church as a whole is in difficulty and in un uncertain times. Four needs of the church. I'll mention them and then I'll deal with one of them. I believe in difficult times. One of the needs, one of the needs of the church is clarity and understanding. Clarity and understanding. God's people need to know what's going on, why is all of this, what is God's word on this, where are we headed, how should I live, what should I do? Clarity and understanding. Because in times like these, Satan does his best job to try to confuse and to conflict the will of God. But secondly, I believe the church needs comfort and assurance. Comfort and assurance. And Revelation supplies it. Clarity and understanding, Revelation provides it. Comfort and assurance, Revelation supplies it. But I believe the church also needs repentance and renewal. Do you think God allowed the church to be shut down? Our, our homes are shut into our homes. No freedom to gather. And I understand what our governments are doing. I'm not knocking what they're doing. I, I applaud what they're doing to protect our nation from the outspread, the outbreak of this virus. But, you know, God didn't, God, that didn't take God by surprise. Like I've heard many preachers say, and obviously we know that. But God has permitted it for a reason. He has placed us in a position where we've got to look to him. And I'm afraid that if we're not careful, we might, like one preacher said, waste this pandemic. We may not attain to the repentance and revival and renewal that I believe God desires to bring about. Because when his churches get to the point where they are sick spiritually and sick morally and engrossed with the world, God steps in and he moves in, friend, to bring our attention back to him. So in a time of crisis, one of the needs of the church is clarity and understanding, comfort and assurance, repentance and renewal, and fourthly, revival and redirection. And I'll hopefully deal with the second, the last, the, the third, the, 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 the three of the, the last ones here. I'm going to deal with them as we go along as the Lord needs. But today I would like to look at the first one. One of the needs of the church in this time of crisis is clarity and understanding. Notice with me in the text. We need clarity concerning the person of Christ. Clarity concerning the person of Christ. The Bible tells me here, in verse number one, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. God has chosen to reveal himself. Jesus has chosen to make himself known. In other words, he's saying, in a time of crisis and declension, as we come to the end of time, the book of Revelation is a good book to read because in that book, my friend, we have clarity concerning the person of Jesus Christ. He's revealed here as the 
holy, one of the members of the Holy Trinity, the Bible tells me, in verse uh, number five, verse number one, actually verse number four and verse number five, it says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which, and it, which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. Clarity concerning the person of Christ. My friend, Revelation supplies that clarity. It plainly tells us that Jesus Christ is one of the members of the triune God. He is, the Bible tells me here, he's the, verse number three, verse number five, he's Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. He's the one who rose from the dead. He's one of the members of the Godhead. The Bible, verse 1, talks about the Father and the Spirit. And verse 2 talks about, and verse 4 talks about the Father and the Spirit. And verse 5 talks about the Son. Verse 1 tells us that this book is about the revelation or the unveiling or the revealing of Jesus Christ. Do you know who Jesus Christ really is? You say, oh yeah, I know him. I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. Do you really know who he is? Do you really know him? Do you know him? Or is he somebody that simply enters your mind once or twice on a Sunday morning? Or is he the one that has been revealed in Revelation? Is he to you the one that has been revealed in Revelation as the God of glory? Notice what the scripture goes on to say. It says in verse number, number eight, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, said the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, as some people say, and you know, false witnesses of Jehovah say that, oh, he's not God. He's not the Almighty God. But here in the Bible, the scripture tells me in verse 8, he says, I am Alpha. I am the beginning and I am Omega. I am the ending. In other words, Jesus Christ knows the beginning from the ending because he preceded the beginning and he knows the ending. Do you know him, my friend? Do you know who he is? The Bible tells me here he is the Almighty. He is the Almighty. He is the Almighty. There's none mightier than him because he's God. Do you really know him? In the time of crisis, the church needs clarity concerning the person of Christ. If you look a little further down in the text, it tells us here in verse number 12 of chapter 1. John said he heard a voice behind him and he said, when he turned in verse 12, he said, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. The seven golden candlesticks are the churches. The churches. And verse 13 says, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one light unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His hair and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes was a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. He had seven preachers in his hand. Oh, what a blessing to know that Jesus holds the preachers. And Jesus holds the pastors in his hands. And Jesus walks among his churches. And Jesus inspects his churches. Do you know him, my friend? Have you recognized that he watches every single movement Every thought of your life and my life, uh, Jesus Christ uh, is in control, praise God. And as John was on the Isle of Patmos, alone, banished for his faith, he had a vision of Jesus Christ, and he saw the Almighty. He saw him, the Bible tells me, his voice as the sound of many waters, and in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a shout, two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. Imagine looking at his face and it is brighter than the sun. And he said in verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me saying unto me, fear not, I am the first and the last. 
I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Praise God. Amen, Jesus. And amen. You know why? Because he wants John to have a very clear picture of who he is. I'm afraid. Our churches today have been entertained to death. We don't ever really get a true real vision of who Jesus is. Last week we talked about Isaiah's vision of Jesus and God. Now we look at John's vision of Jesus Christ as he was quarantined on the Isle of Patmos, banished. Most likely he died there. But in that moment, God gave him clarity. You see, John was not having some, some, some dream because he had too much food the day before. John was not hallucinating. John was having a clear revelation of Jesus Christ. And my friend, anytime Jesus reveals himself, your life and my life could never be the same. Never be the same. Never be the same. And I believe this power in which the church lives. The church needs, oh my God, the church desperately needs clarity and understanding concerning the person of Christ. Jesus is not take it or leave it, friend. Jesus is not, uh, you, know, you know, he's just one of the additions to my spirit. Jesus is God. He says, I am he that liveth and was dead, praise God. But he says, I am alive forevermore and I hold the keys of hell and death. What the church needs is clarity concerning the person of Jesus Christ. Because this is an hour in which many, many, many people will claim to have had visions of Christ. It's interesting to note that many people are talking about prophecies about coronavirus after it came. You never heard them before. They were saying, this is what I said in 2017 or 2015. Nobody, nobody can claim that they prophesied about this before it came. But the Bible reveals that in this time of crisis, God's people need clarity concerning the person of Christ. Do you know him, friend? Are you clear on who he is? He's not just a man upstairs. He's the God of all gods. He is, he is, the Bible tells me, he says he is the almighty. He is the alpha and the omega. Whether you like it or not, he's coming back in power and great glory. And every single one of us will stand at the judgment seat of Christ, friend, if you're saved. And if you're not saved and you die without Christ, you will stand at the great white throne judgment where you will be cast into a lake of fire and burn forever, regardless of what you think Jesus Christ or who you think he is this morning. The Bible reveals who he is. And before we go into the book of Revelation, God wants to make it very clear who's talking. He wants to make it very clear who Jesus is. The clarity concerning the person of Jesus Christ. I'm told that now the death, the death toll of coronavirus victims have now reached over 200,000. That's 200,000 souls that checked into eternity over the last couple of months, last few months. And nobody knows how many more will go. Whether it's corona or cancer or car accidents or some other means of, of, of death, my friend, the truth is this, every single human being will one day stand before Jesus Christ. You need clarity concerning who he is. But secondly, we need clarity concerning the prophecies of Scripture. Notice the Bible tells me here, in verse number one, the revelation of Jesus, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants, notice that, things which must shortly come to pass. I'm glad, I am so glad, that God not only provides clarity concerning the person of Christ, but clarity concerning the prophecies of Scripture. 
You see, if we're not clear concerning who Christ is, then we'll never be clear concerning what he prophesied. But notice the Bible tells me that God wrote this book, he gave this book, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. God wants you to know, church member. God wants me to know. God wants us to tell the world of the prophecies of Scripture. We are not prophets in the sense of foretelling anything. There are some charlatans out there who are claiming that they are prophets and bishops and they could prophesy and God gave them a word of prophecy and that kind of foolishness, my friend. The Bible reveals that all prophecies have already been written down, praise God. The scripture is complete. And all that we are doing as faithful servants of God and stars that Jesus holds in his hands, all we are doing is telling forth what God has foretold. And so God says, I want to be clear concerning the prophecies of the Bible. He wants us to know the things that which shortly, that must shortly come to pass. Hallelujah. I'm glad that God gives us advance notice, advance warning. And he says, I want you to know exactly what I plan to do with this world. Clarity concerning the prophecies of scripture. Notice he says here, he sent, he sent in verse number one, he gave, he said, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. You know, the coronavirus and all of the events around the land is indicative of the fact that God's word is true. God's word is true. God did say many years ago, that this world will become a global, literally a global village. God did say that this world will come into a one world system, one world government, one world church. And my friend, it seems that the, 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 the apostasy of the church, what people call Christianity today, is so far removed from the Bible that I'm not even sure that many, many of the of the younger generation know exactly what biblical Christianity really is. We got a lot of Bible teaching, yes. But how many people have displayed true biblical wisdom and discernment? Leaders who don't know where the scripture leads. But the Bible reveals that God wants us to be clear concerning the prophecies of Scripture. One of the very clear prophecies of the Bible is that Jesus Christ is coming again. Is coming again. You see, well, I heard that from the time I was a child. I don't care how long you heard it, but Jesus is coming again. The Bible tells us he's coming again. Jesus said he will return, and no matter how long it takes, he will return. And when he comes, he's only coming now to take those who are saved by the grace of God. You need clarity concerning the prophecies of the scriptures. Many years ago, a false prophet, a woman false prophet, she claimed that Jesus was coming in 1844. And God helped followers to gather somewhere and wait for him. Well, of course, Jesus did not come because they were false in their, predict their predictions and they were, they, were, they were not clear concerning the prophecies of the Bible. There are some who say it's not going to come at all. They are not clear concerning the prophecies of the Bible. There are some believers who are living like Jesus is not going to come back anytime. They are not clear concerning the prophecies of the Bible. You know why God gave us prophecies in the Word of God? He gave us so we will be ready. If a child of God doesn't live, if we don't live, like he could come any moment, it means we're not clear concerning the prophecies of the Bible. We got head knowledge, but not heart knowledge. But thirdly, I want to notice, not only does God want to provide through the book of Revelation clarity concerning the person of Christ and clarity and understanding concerning the prophecies of Scripture, but he wants to provide clarity concerning the priority of preaching. Notice in verse 2, he says, uh, John got this revelation from Jesus Christ, and he says, who bear record of the words of God? That's John. So God gave it to Jesus Christ. Jesus gave it to an angel. The angel gave it to John, and John was supposed to give it to his servants, the servants of God. So it came from God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the angel, John. John now is supposed to tell it to the church. 
Verse number two. Who bear, that's John, bear record of the words of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. John was supposed to preach what he received from Jesus Christ. The priority of preaching. Jesus wants us to have clarity and understanding in these times concerning the priority of preaching. Oh, my friend, preaching. What a time to be preaching. What a time for the stars that are in the hand of Jesus Christ, the prophets of God, the true servants of the living God, the pastors who love their people, pastors who have a passion for the word of God, Pastors who are clear concerning the person of Christ. Pastors who are clear concerning the prophecies of Scripture. Oh, how they need to preach. The priority of preaching. 2 Timothy 4, 2 tells us this. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. In season is when the church can gather in the house of worship. In season is when the choir can sing. In season is when everybody can come to the parking lot and step into the house of God and sing and glorify God. In season is when there is no persecution and troubles and trials. In season is when the comforts of life are here. Preach, the Bible says. Preach. But then it says in season and out of season. Out of season is like now. But the church cannot gather. Physically. Out of season. It's like now. When God's people are shut in and shut off. In season. Out of season. is when God's people, my friend, cannot have the normal routine of their lives. The Bible says to the stars of God, the prophets of God. Preach. Preach, preacher. Preach. Preach the word. Be instant in season. And out of season. First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 18 says. For the preaching of the cross. Is to them that perish foolishness. In Romans 10 15 the Bible says. How shall they hear without a preacher. A preacher. A preacher. Oh the need for preaching. The priority of preaching. I know many people like the little teaching, you know, two, two minutes of a little teach. Nothing wrong with teaching. There's a place for teaching. But my Bible tells me that people will not truly hear the gospel except they hear the preacher. How shall they preach except they be sent? And God sent John. He said, John, you go preach that to the churches. I believe the people who need more preaching than anybody else in the church. We will be clear on the priority of preaching. Some folks can't take a whole lot of preaching. They like a little word here, a little word there, a little tingling of the air, like the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy. They have itching ears. They, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and turn their ears away from the truth. My fear in this time, my friend, is that many will turn their ears away from the truth. They will log on to some little thing they could choose on the internet. And turn their back from preaching. You see, when we can gather the house of God, you might not be able to run from preaching as you would probably be able to run from preaching on your computer. But don't run from preaching. Because John was given a vision. And Jesus Christ made it clear who he was. And God made it clear concerning the prophecies of the scripture. And God made it clear concerning the priority of preaching. My friend, I long for the day, yes, when you can look people in the eyes and preach. When like John the Baptist, you could say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I know we can say that across the internet, but there's nothing like having the people of God sitting there or the people, the unsaved sitting there and listen to the word of God. My friend, God says you need clarity and I need clarity concerning the priority of preaching. God says to John, go and tell. Get this testimony of Jesus Christ. Bear record of this word of God. What an opportunity, my friend. I thank God 
that we can reach many more people, even through this medium. Thank God for that. I praise the Lord that we could reach lives that we never dreamed we could ever touch through this medium. Praise God for that. But I want to challenge the church. Don't let the enemy put you in a spirit of coldness by picking and choosing some little message that makes it palatable to you. Listen to good old-fashioned preaching. Men of God, stars of God who love God and who preach this old King James Bible and are clear concerning the person of Jesus Christ and are clear concerning the prophecies of the Bible. You turn your ears away from all this charismatic movement and all that stuff that twists and turns the word of God and brings false information into the hearts of God's people. My friend, don't you ever reject the priority of preaching because God said to John, if you're going to deal with Revelation, Revelation is a book of preaching. The priority of preaching. But lastly, we need clarity in these times. Not only clarity concerning the person of Christ, and clarity concerning the prophecies of Scripture, and clarity concerning the priority of preaching. But we need clarity concerning the profitability of studying the Word of God. The profitability of study. Look what the Scripture tells us in verse number 3. It says, blessed is he that readeth. <laughs> he that readeth. How many of God's people have actually read the book of Revelation? Oh, a pastor, I cannot understand it. It's too hard. Well, maybe, praise God, maybe you need a little clarity concerning the person of Jesus Christ. Because I'm glad to let you know that he reveals his word to you. If his spirit dwells inside of you. And I'm not saying that you don't understand everything. I don't even understand everything in this book. But it's an awesome book to read in these times. And God has attached a blessing to those who read it. Notice what it says. Blessed. It's a beatitude. Blessed is he that read it. Just read it. And my challenge to the church beginning today is to read through the book of Revelation. Read it slowly. Read it carefully. Read it devotionally. Read it constantly. Read it expectantly. Read the book. Read the book. God said, blessed is he that read that. If you have a Bible, it should have revelation in it. And if it has revelation in it, it was given to you and given to me to read. So read it. The profitability of studying the word of God. Blessed is he that read. And he says, blessed is he that hear. So not only should you read it, but get to church and hear it. Get to church and you'll say, Pastor, I can't come now. Well, get up early Sunday morning. Get ready. Get before a, 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 telephone, a phone or a TV or a, an iPad. Get before something where the word of God is being preached, where revelation is being taught, or any other truth from the word of God. And engage yourself in listening to the word of God. They should become a spiritual casualty in the midst of Corona. My fear is that many of God's people will become spiritual casualties in the midst of Corona. Banish, but they will not be blessed. God says to John, blessed is he that reads, he that hears. But then he says, and those that keep the things written in the book that is written therein for the time is at hand. Notice that as we look closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, it should be a greater motivation. There should be greater motivation to read the book of Revelation. Notice it says, blessed are those who hear and those who keep and those who, those who hear, uh, those who read, those who hear and those who keep. So you notice the progression in studying you read it, you listen to it, and then you do what it says. There are commands in here for the church. We're going to get to them as we're going to look at uh, God's messages to the various churches. But John was given this vision in this time of crisis. And God provides, first of all, the needs of the church. One of the four needs of the church is clarity and understanding. And this book provides it by giving clarity concerning the person of Christ. 
and clarity concerning the prophecies of the scriptures and clarity concerning the priority of preaching and clarity concerning the profitability of studying the word of God. Read it, hear it, obey it. You say, Pastor, why do we need clarity and understanding in times of crisis? Well, many times when people's hearts are disturbed and confused, they make sometimes bad decisions. Satan manipulates those situations. But the book of God, God's word, the Bible, gives clarity. And as we explore this book, I believe God's going to give you clarity and understand. You say, Pastor, why do I need that? Well, we need clarity and understanding in times of crisis so that we can interpret the current circumstances in light of the person of Jesus Christ, in light of the prophecies of the scripture, in light of the priority of preaching, and in light of the profitability of personal study. You see, everything that's happening now, in some way or the other, is related to Jesus Christ. Either it's related positively or negatively. It's either for him or against him. So the child of God needs to view all of the circumstances of life, including coronavirus, including the downturn in our economy, including the death of loved ones, including the illness, the sickness, the disease, the burden, the problems, the struggle, the stress. The child of God needs to view all of current circumstances in light of the person of Jesus Christ. What is Christ seeking to accomplish? How does that relate to him? Clarity is needed to interpret current circumstances. Clarity is given to us so that we can evaluate our time, the time in which we live presently. And we can evaluate in this time our relationship with Jesus Christ and evaluate our future state in eternity. Here's what the Bible tells us. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it says this, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except to be reprobates. In other words, God saying in times like these, each person needs to examine himself to see whether or not he's a child of God, whether he's in the faith. Because either Jesus Christ is in you, or you are a reprobate. And the events of revelation will affect you a certain way based upon your relationship with Jesus Christ. If Christ is in you, praise God, you won't experience all of the judgments of Revelation. But if Christ is not in you, and you're left behind after the rapture, then you are reprobate, and you will experience the awful judgments of Revelation. You see, clarity is always provided by God. So we could examine ourselves in the light of his word. And Paul said, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own self. Know you not that Jesus, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. As a matter of fact, it tells us in 2 Peter 1.10, Wherefore they rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Everything is related to your relationship with Jesus Christ. If he's in you, praise God. 
If it's not in you, you are a reprobate. You're unsaved. And God wants to save you. And here's what he tells us. He tells us to preach that he is the one who came from heaven and gave his life willingly on the cross. And he's the one who died for the sins of the world. Because he wants to bring the world into right relationship with him. Sadly, many have rejected him. But in this current time in which we live, his arms are still wide open. His love is available. He is waiting for any person who has not received Jesus Christ in their heart. He's waiting for them to call upon him and ask him to forgive them of their sin. The Bible tells me this. It tells me for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's pretty clear. He tells me that there is not a just man on the earth that said it not. He tells me that all are sins. There is none righteous. But praise God, the scripture also tells me that although we are all sinners, and according to Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Although we all deserve to die and be separated from God forever. The Bible tells me that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he, by his sacrifice on Calvary, where he said in Revelation, he was dead and he's alive. The same Jesus who John saw is now calling you to repent, to turn from your direction and turn from the way you're going and have him ask him to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you and come into your life. And then Christ will be in you and you won't be a reprobate. You'll be a child of God. And if he comes today, you'll go in, you'll be certain, going with him to heaven. My question to you this morning is this. Are you clear concerning the person of Christ? If not, my friend, he is longing and he's willing and ready to see you. If you would bow your head and ask him to come into your life right now. Give your life to him. I'll pray a simple prayer. And if you'd like to trust Jesus Christ and your Savior, why don't you do that right now? Church of the living God, I pray that God will help us to see the need to not allow this pandemic, this crisis, to rob us of an opportunity to get a fresh vision of Christ. But if, we, if you listen to my voice this morning, you're not a child of God. I said, Pastor, I would like to be, become a Christian. Will you pray this simple prayer with me? Let's pray. Father, please help that one again to trust you. If you'd like to be saved right now, will you pray with me? Say with me, Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. Your word tells me so. Your word tells me that I am lost. And in myself, I cannot save myself. I come to you today, Lord, as a sinner who rebelled against you. I now ask you, Lord, to forgive me. I recognize that I deserve to die and go to hell for my sins. But I realize that Jesus Christ came to give a new relationship. He came to give me life. And it's clear who he is. He's the Almighty. I now repent of my sins and I ask you to come into my heart and save me. Wash me in your precious blood. Make me your child. I now give you my life and I ask you to come into my heart today. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. My friend, if you pray that prayer, please call us. We'll be glad to hear from you and help you to grow in Christ. May the Lord bless you. We'll see you this evening at 6 p.m.